Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the QT Faculty of Law, to our symposium on copyright law and the creative industries. Uh, the purpose of this event is to bring together creative practitioners, uh, cultural, institutional representatives, and uh, legal academics and lawyers uh, to discuss the intersection between copyright law, creativity, and culture. As is always the case at QT, um, in keeping with the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where QT now stands and recognise that these have always been places of teaching and learning. We wish to pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play within the QT community. Uh, my presentation today is on the right to repair in Australia, patent law and 3D printing in a circuit economy. Uh, my argument in this paper is that Australia needs to recognise a holistic uh, right to repair, cutting across all the different domains of intellectual property, uh, but also being embedded in other forms of regulation, like consumer law, competition policy, and questions about um, product stewardship and sustainable development. Uh, my presentation in particular is going to focus upon patent law and 3D printing in a circular economy. Uh, and really this particular presentation is part of a larger piece of work that I've been doing in relation to intellectual property and 3D printing. Uh, 3D printing is often being used to repair, refurbish and embellish past inventions. There's obviously tensions there between the protection afforded by patent law to new inventions and the interests in 3D printing and maker communities for there to be um, a sharing of inventions, but a fiction of inventions and a refurbishment of various different inventions. Uh, from an Australian perspective, there is a kind of a long history of repair. Uh, so some of my family are from Shepparton in Victoria and the Fords, uh, who are my, my family, are very great friends of the Furfies. The Furfies are kind of known as storytellers and inventors and more recently uh, their name has been co-opted to be the name of a, a brand of beer in Victoria. Um, the Furfies in colonial Victoria uh, ran uh, blacksmiths and made all sorts of agricultural machinery uh, and they would sell that at agricultural fairs. They became particularly famous for their water carts and because of the tall stories told by soldiers and others at water carts during World War I, um, the term furphy has become a bit of a synonym for a tall tale uh, or an exaggerated story. But at that particular time, Australia was really affected by the tyranny of distance. Uh, Australia was far, far away from uh, colonial and imperial overlords in the United Kingdom. It sometimes took a very long time for spare parts to come from the United Kingdom to Australia. Um, so as a result, there was a very strong culture of local repair um, and trying to fix products. And that was certainly accentuated after Federation with the Great Depression. Uh, there was a, a kind of a frugal effort of trying to fix and repair inventions that were available. Um, and I guess the striking thing for me is that there are echoes of that in some of our contemporary debates at the moment over the right to repair and the need for there to be a local right to repair. Um, so that is one of the famous furphy water carts. More recently in Australia, there has been growing litigation and public policy debate over the right to repair. There's been increasing conflicts between intellectual property owners and intellectual property users in respect of repairs. In my talk today, I'd like to focus on one of the disputes in relation to patents and repairs. Um, but there has also been a very important precedent under designs law um, in respect of the operation of the spare parts defence, which has taken a broad reading of the spare parts defence. 
there have been um, some conflicts in relation to Australian consumer law and how they affect repairs. There has been some large discussions about how competition policy operates um, in respect of aftermarkets as well. And in response, there's been a fragmented series of law reform inquiries. Um, so the Treasury um, had an inquiry into a mandatory scheme for the sharing of motor vehicle service and repair information, and that built upon previous work by the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. Um, to my mind, that was a very narrowly framed inquiry. Um, it might be one thing for an automobile repairer to get access to information, uh, but if they can't use the intellectual property or have access to the intellectual property, that seems to me very problematic. So I think Treasury's response was a very limited one. There's been a lot of concern uh, about agricultural uh, tech companies like John Deere trying to enforce their intellectual property around software related to things like their tractors. There's been a revolt uh, led by, amongst others, the nationals in Western Australia who have been very concerned about the high cost of repairs, high cost of parts. And they think there's a very kind of anti-competitive environment um, and they have kind of complained that there needs to be recognition for a right to repair. Moreover, the issue of the right to repair has also come up in discussions of product stewardship with the Product Stewardship Act of 2011. Uh, the debate by IP Australia in relation to reforming our Designs Act had a bit of discussion about the right to repair. Um, Shane Rattenbury, the ACT Minister for Justice as well as Minister for Consumer Affairs, has called for the Productivity Commission to conduct an inquiry into the right to repair. He wants the federal government as well as the states and territories to work in a collaborative approach to provide for a common framework to recognise the right to repair. As part of my fieldwork, I kind of interviewed Shane Rattenbury about his proposal in respect of the right to repair in February 2020. Um, and today, uh, this call has really been taken up with the Productivity Commission um, being given uh, terms of reference to inquire into the right to repair in Australia in a holistic fashion, thinking about intellectual property, consumer law, competition policy, questions about green waste and stewardship. Um, hopefully that will provide an opportunity uh, to have a very holistic approach. Um, but it's worth noting that other competition regulators around the world, like uh, the Federal Trade Commission, have also been very concerned about this issue as well. In terms of legal disciplines, there are an array of different legal disciplines implicated by the right to repair. And I think my argument in my paper is that we need to do better thinking about the interrelationship between some of these disciplines. I think in intellectual property law and in patent law, there's been a real problem with very technocratic approaches to the right to repair that just focus in a very narrow way on the doctrines of patent law and some of the other forms of intellectual property. And, does not, and that work does not properly take into account the social objectives and the public welfare ideas that are embedded in relation to consumer law and competition policy, some are concerns about environmental law, eco-design and sustainable development, as well as larger considerations about international trade law. So I think there's a real need for us to change our approach to intellectual property and think more relationally between the discipline and some of the uh, regimes that it intersects with. We can no longer have this strange notion that intellectual property is somehow autonomous and separate from consumer law and competition policy. We need to think about the interconnections between those regimes in a much more holistic fashion. As I said uh, earlier, there's also a need to kind of get some consistency between the different regimes of intellectual property in terms of the approach to the right to repair. So, you know, copyright law tries to approach the issue in terms of copyright exceptions, 
and uh, technological protection measures and exceptions to those measures. Designs law has a special spare parts defence. There has been trademark litigation, like by Apple against some poor Norwegian independent repairer. Um, but trademark law itself does not provide good recognition of a right to repair. Patent law doesn't have a separate defence at the moment, but it has some very murky distinctions that it draws between what is a patent infringement and what is not a patent infringement. Uh, there hasn't necessarily been a strong recognition of the right to repair in trade secrets law or in respect of data information. So my overarching argument is that we need more consistency across these regimes. Uh, given that intellectual property can be bundled together and involve copyright, patents, designs, trademarks, it seems to me very problematic that repairing something might be defensible under one regime, but not under several other regimes. So I think there needs to be greater consistency within the intellectual property system in terms of its approach to the right to repair. So in my talk, I want to talk a little bit about patent infringement, patent exhaustion and the implied license, 3D printing and possible options in relation to patent defences and exceptions. In terms of patent infringement, patent exhaustion and the implied licence, um, there's been a bit of litigation overseas. Um, the United States has drawn a distinction between, between permissible repair of a patented article and impermissible reconstruction of a patent article which is a patent infringement. Um, in the UK, um, the Supreme Court has considered the relationship between patent law and repairs. Um, in Australia, we finally got a key case involving a dispute over ink refills for 2D computer printers. Um, in the 2017 case of Psycho, um, Epson Corporation versus Caladad, Burley uh, Justice of the uh, Federal Court of Australia noted that in the fiercely competitive world of computer printers and ink refills for those printers, um, the first applicant is a global payer. Nine Star SDN from Malaysia bought empty cartridges, refilled them with ink and then sold them to Caladad. Um, the judge in this particular case held that the central dispute in these proceedings concerns the right of a patentee to control or limit what may be done with a patent product after it has been sold. Um, the judge explored the question, when a patentee um, sells a chattel that embodies an invention claimed in a patent, can the patentee restrain the subsequent use made of it by a purchaser or a successor entitled to the purchaser? In this case, Burley held that Psycho's infringement claim succeed or succeeds for Catalad's past range of products, but not in respect of its current products. Um, so that was kind of an important ruling. It's been considered by the full court of the federal court. Um, Justice Greenwood, a very experienced intellectual property judge, noted that these proceedings raise an important question concerning the extent to which a patentee can prevent a person who has acquired a title to a patented product from, put simply for the present purposes, manipulating or repurposing the product. Um, the judge considered the nature and the scope of an implied licence. Um, the judge kind of noted that a CDP is imported into Australia for sale, kept for sale, off for sale and sold a product that, that is not fall within the scope and content of the implied licence. Greenwood just held that Caladad had infringed Psycho's patents. Justice Jago also dismissed the appeal um, by Caladad. Um, the judge emphasised that the modifications did not amount to the repair of the cartridge. So there was this very distinct definition of what a repair was. Um, 
Justice Jago held that repair is one of the concepts like modifying or adapting, which shares a boundary with making but does not trespass upon its territory. And in this case, um, the judge really wanted to focus upon what was really um, a repair. And the judge in this case said that a purchaser has no right to make a new embodiment of the invention. Um, and Justice Yates also dealt directly with the question of the right to repair. Um, and the judge said that Caledad's inclusion of a right to refurbishment uh, appears to be an embellishment of the subject matter dealt with in the United Kingdom cases. Uh, and the judge said, uh, on no reasonable view can it be said that the modifications carried out by Nine Star to the original Epsom cartridges constituted a, a repair. Um, really, they turned them into another product. So, full court of the federal court found that really this was a case of patent infringement. The matter has then gone to the High Court of Australia. Um, in February 2020, the High Court received written submissions from the parties. There is a little bit of discussion in terms of the written submissions about the question of repair um, and what relevance some of the other authorities like uh, the US Supreme Court decision in Impression Products versus Lexmark might have. Um, the progress of the case was affected by the coronavirus outbreak, uh, but there was finally a hearing on the 12th of August, 2020. A number of judges, including Chief Justice Kiefel, Edelman and Gagler, were particularly active um, with their questions for counsel. Um, and there was quite a bit of discussion um, by AJ Bannon about the nature of a repair and David uh, Shavan about their submissions in relation to a repair. It'll be interesting to see what the High Court says in that peak of decision. I'm reminded by some of the previous comments by former Justice Michael Kirby in the Stevens versus Sony case, which was the case about copyright law and competition policy. Um, but nonetheless, I remember that Kirby noted that the right of the individual to enjoy lawfully acquired private property would ordinarily be a right inherent in Australian law upon acquisition of such a, a chattel. Um, so I, th I think there's some interesting questions there about exhaustion of rights, the interaction between property and intellectual property. Um, writing about the case, uh, F.B. Rice patent attorneys Paul Wenham and Sarah Glasson hope that we think that it's an important opportunity for the High Court of Australia to recognise the importance of waste reduction and product design that permits product reuse. They say that the Seco Epson cartridges were not designed for reuse and nowhere in the patent is there anything to suggest how the cartridges could be reused. So they're trying to make a black letter law argument in relation to uh, that there was not patent infringement. Um, but they conclude that at this time the High Court has a pivotal role uh, to play in ensuring that the patent system is in harmony with this societal objective. And I would argue there are larger societal objectives that need to be achieved by the patent regime, including boosting consumer rights, competition policy, sustainable uh, development, stewardship, um, and dealing with some of the other concerns that have been raised by policymakers. I just want to kind of briefly kind of make the point that these issues that we see with um, traditional printing uh, are amplified by the new wave of technologies um, that are appearing in relation to 3D printing and additive manufacturing and some of the communities that have been built up around those communities, like the maker movement, uh, like the repair cafes that are springing up around the world um, and some of the organisations that are focused on fixing. Um, my concern is that there seems to be a really stark tension between um, the very strong patent rights awarded to patent owners in the interests of makers in repairing, fixing, refurbishing, um, embellishing 
broken inventions of one kind or another. Corey Doctorow has been a great champion of the right to repair from a maker context. Um, but Chris Anderson in his book Makers, uh, Dale Doherty and the Make Movement um, have been very keen on promoting makers' rights. Indeed, Make Ma Magazine published the Makers' Bill of Rights over a decade ago and they kind of emphasised uh, the importance for there to be a right to repair. And I kind of argue in my paper that really um, in thinking about the reform of the patent regime, we need to take into account better some of these interests about the need for products to be um, repairable but also open to interoperability. Um, ease of repair shall be a design ideal, not an afterthought. I think our patent regime need to, uh, needs to kind of embed some of these key concepts into its system. Likewise, there's also been a significant fab lab movement that has been created. When I was doing field work in the European Union, it was very notable, noticeable that fab labs around the European Union, amongst other things, were involved with fixing broken products of one kind or another. That was one of the community functions that it served. Carl Weens and I Fix It um, have done teardowns of products, have tried to explain how to fix products, have tried to make um, manuals open and accessible. They have published the Repair Manifesto. If you can't fix it, you don't own it. Um, they emphasise repair is better than recycling. Repair saves you money. Repair teaches engineering. Repair saves the planet. I think the, in thinking about the reform of our patent system, we also need to think about the Repair Manifesto in some of its objectives. Uh, but this is much more striking in the European Union where there's been a very strong right to repair movement and recognition of the importance um, of eco-design um, for a wide range of different inventions. From uh, the context of 3D printing, um, scholars like Professor Mark Lemley have kind of noted that really we're in an age of great abundance um, 3D printing is one of many technologies that undermines the artificial scarcity of intellectual property. We need to rethink intellectual property to better understand what's going on in relation to 3D printing. Um, so his kind of comments, I think, are opposite to rethinking intellectual property in, and repair in an age of uh, such technologies. Professor Janusha Mendez from Bournemouth University has done empirical work um, on repairs and 3D printing. Um, she has noted that it's very much dependent and contingent upon the sector involved, uh, but she kind of predicts that over time there will be a greater and greater use of 3D printing and out of manufacturing um, for the purposes of repair. And we really need to think about what are the implications of consumers and independent repair companies being able to manufacture spare parts for domestic appliances on demand using consumer 3D printers. Uh, Dr. Angela Daly, uh, now in Scotland, uh, has noted that there are significant product liability issues bound up with questions of repair. So she says we shouldn't just think about questions about intellectual property, we should think about product integrity and product quality. What happens if something breaks uh, and you fix it in a way that is defective? Um, she says that we need to grapple with those questions. Uh, Dr. Rosa Maria Balladini from Finland and her fellow researchers um, have been very interested in the connection between intellectual property and sustainable development and really see 3D printing has been very much part of that. And she argues that we need to rethink intellectual property to promote a circular economy and sustainable development. Um, Miles Park um, from the University of New South Wales has said that 3D printing could transform how products are designed, manufactured, distributed and sold. Um, Kelsey Wil Wilbanks has said that we need to rethink how patent precedents and the right to repair will operate in the context of 3D printing. And she notes there's a real lack of a bright line between repair and reconstruction in United States presidents in relation to 
patience and infringement. Um, Tesh Dagne and his colleague have considered the right to repair doctrine and the use of 3D printing technology under Canadian um, patent law. And Dana Bilderman has also been kind of very interested in some of these issues as well. So I think that kind of literature view is kind of helpful in highlighting that we not only have to think about patents and how uh, the patent regime deals with repair at the moment using current technologies, but we have to kind of think about how this system will operate with these new technologies that are coming on. And I guess in terms of my law reform argument, I think we should do a number of things. Uh, I would argue the Productivity Commission in its inquiry should contemplate a general defence for the right to repair, but that does mean within the patent system that we recognise explicitly a defence for the right to repair. I think it is too vague and uncertain and ambiguous to try to work out what is a patent infringement and what is not a patent infringement. Looking at the UK presidents, the US presidents, and trying to work my way through that very complex, dense Australian case, I think there's a real lack of clarity there about whether or not a repair is permissible. And I think the best way to deal with that is to establish a new defence. Uh, we've recently reformed the compulsory licensing regime in Australia. I think that regime might be of help if there are anti-competitive markets in secondary markets uh, dealing with repairs in different fields and different contexts. Uh, it's been a big problem that we haven't used our compulsory licensing laws in the past. I think if we actively use those laws, I think that would stop some of these monopolies from developing um, in some of these sectors. Likewise, crown use or government use could provide access to key inventions as well. Um, if patent holders were refusing permission to give access to inventions and it was adversely affecting competition, I think crown use would be helpful in facilitating access to those inventions. Moreover, I think there needs to be proper competition oversight. In Australia, we have finally um, recognised that the uh, competition regulator should have oversight of all the different forms of intellectual property. Previously in Section 51, there was a strange limitation which uh, the ACCC thought was limiting or restricting its jurisdiction. I think it's really important the ACCC provide some proper oversight of these various markets and consider whether the aggregation of intellectual property rights is resulting in uh, the creation of monopolies in various different ways. And we've already seen in the digital platforms inquiry that the ACCC is now grappling with um, the problem of the economic power and political power associated with IT monopolies. It's notable that some of those players have been involved in some of the battles over the right to repair. So Apple in particular has been a very notable opponent to the right to repair and uh, they have been seen as a very aggressive monopolist in that space. So I think that is a really important and significant um, development. Um, researchers in the field like Zephyr Teachout have been suggesting of late that we need to break them up uh, when it comes to some of the big monopolies that are formed. And in her uh, recent book, amongst other things, she kind of mentions the issue of the right to repair um, both in terms of agricultural markets and IT markets and vehicle markets. Um, it, it certainly seems that we need to think about stronger competition solutions um, to deal with repair markets. And finally, I think it's really important to kind of prohibit the contracting out of the right to repair. So as my colleague Leanne Wiseman has kind of pointed out, uh, it's not very clear in terms of our intellectual property laws whether intellectual property owners by private contract can require intellectual property users to contract out of exceptions. And I think the best approach would be to have a very clear prohibition to stop, say, Apple by reason of a contract 
requiring users of the Apple system to contract out of using their right to repair. So to my mind, that is not just a frivolous afterthought. It's really important that in terms of contract law, uh, we stop these companies using their economic power to pressure users to contract out of the right to repair. So in conclusion, um, I've really been arguing today that we need a general right to repair. Each of the different disciplines needs to better embody the right to repair and defences. In relation to patent law, I have suggested that uh, we need to recognise a right to repair. We need to use compulsory licensing and crown use and competition oversight. We also need to stop contracting out of the right to repair as well. Um, I think this is part of a larger conversation about intellectual property and sustainable development. A Nobel laureate, Professor Joseph Stiglitz, has argued that we need to rethink our intellectual property institutions, treaties and laws to better take into account the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And in particular, goal number 12 is very much focused on responsible consumption and production. And if that is going to have meaning, I do think we need to reshape our intellectual property laws. Um, and I think there are lots of interesting connections there between intellectual property and particularly that um, goal focused upon responsible consumption and production. Uh, also, the COVID crisis has highlighted that the right to repair is not just important to agriculture, uh, to manufacturing, to information technology, uh, but it is really a question of life and death when it comes to fixing medical equipment and health equipment. Um, the coronavirus impact, amongst other things, has been to highlight um, scarcity and supplies of personal protective equipment, but also key medical equipment like ventilators. Indeed, uh, there has even been debate that uh, intellectual property owners have tried to stop 3D makers in Italy from using 3D printed valves to fix ventilators. Um, the uh, California government complained that the federal government of the United States gave them a bunch of broken ventilators that they were forced to then fix. Oregon Senator Ron Wyden, who has been recognised previously um, by the Electronic Frontier Foundation in its Pioneer Awards for his work on IT, has become a champion for law reform for the right to repair um, and he has put forward a new bill uh, which is the Critical Medical Infrastructure Right to Repair Act of 2020 um, and it's a narrowly tailored bill that tries to stop actions being brought for infringement in relation to copyright, technological protection measures um, as well as uh, designs um, there's some debate about it, its other kind of scope as well. He has argued um, this is a really urgent need, given all the problems at the moment, in fixing short of supply medical technology. Um, but really perhaps it's also part of the larger conversation about intellectual property and the coronavirus. There's been a push to try to get greater intellectual property flexibilities to provide access to COVID-related technologies. And I think the right to repair is a part of that discussion or a part of that conversation. I just want to finish off by noting uh, that Edward Snowden in his book, Permanent Record, uh, talks about how the right to repair uh, is really important as a matter of freedom and civil liberties. Uh, and that is a really interesting part of his book as well as his kind of discussion about the importance of privacy and freedom of speech. He's also a champion for the right to repair. And thinking into the future, uh, it's noticeable as a Star Wars um, fanboy and watching uh, some of the uh, recent films uh, that there's a very strong theme about uh, the resistance and the rebel reliance relying upon hacking, scavenging, uh, um, fixing and repairing uh, broken technology of, of one kind or another. 
so even in a galaxy far, far away, I think the right to repair is a very important and significant right to recognise. Thank you very much.